When we're praying this prayer, think of yourself, right? I say this every week. I hope that it gets in, deep in. So we'll do it together. You ready? How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you decided to live in us, to dwell in us. But, Lord, most of all, thank you that you decided to empower us. You empowered us with, with power that none of us in this room have even glimpsed yet. Uh, Lord, it's what we've been talking about. It's what we're continuing to talk about today, Lord. Please, Father, help us to know who we are. Help us to know who we are in Christ. Help us to know who you say we are, Lord. Not what other things say, not what circumstances say, not what our father said when we were four, none of that, Lord, but what you say. So help us, Father. And Lord, I pray once again, I pray, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, to, to articulate what you want to be said today. I pray that my words would be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. So the question I got for us this morning is, why do you think we're all so confused? Not you, right, Johnny? You ain't confused, man. You, you, got, you got it down. I, know. I just want to read scripture quick out of Romans chapter 12. Very, uh, I guess, popular verse would be a good... Romans chapter 12. I bought my phone today because I'm going to be bopping around a lot and... Uh, Romans 12, 2 says this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, why does God want to renew our mind? This is why. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So that you may prove what the will of God is. See, that's insinuating to me that if my mind doesn't get renewed, my mind is very, very capable of proving what the will of God isn't. (laughs) Does that make sense? And not only that, but believe it. But believe it. So God says, let me take control of your head. Let me, let me get in control of your brain. Let me get control of the way you think. And you'll have a definitely a different perspective in life. So that's what we want. We want to keep in talking about that. So you guys with me? Amen. Won't be long. I know it's warm. Won't be long. So identity, confusion, in my opinion, is ongoing everywhere. Everywhere. I, I said it once. I said it a thousand times. I believe that. There's a, an identity crisis in the church at large. Because like I said earlier, if we really knew who we were in Christ, if we were like Christ, things would be immensely different on this, on this earth. Um, I don't know, has anybody told a mountain to jump into the river and it did? Did anybody do that in there? Has anybody laid hands on a dead person and see them come back to life in this room? I've seen it. I've seen it, but not yet. Right, we're learning. We're learning. Touch the blind, see their sight reheal. Touch the lame, see them walk. Set the captives free. Lay hands on the oppressed and see them change like that, like Jesus did. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. And why could Jesus do that and we don't? Because Jesus absolutely knew who he was and we struggle with it. We struggle with it. But again, I have to, I, I cannot stress this enough. We have to embrace the humanity of Christ. Because if, if, if we don't, then we'll never do what he did. We'll never be what the Bible says we can be, ever. We'll, we'll believe that he was like Thor that fell out of the sky with superhuman powers, and we have no chance. But that's not what the Bible tells us. That's not what the Bible teaches us. So we have to look at this. So identity confusion, in my opinion, is ongoing, and it's ongoing everywhere. We live in a digital generation that is being constantly bombarded with random and opposing messages about who we are and even what we are. I, I don't know how the world got to that point where now we question what we are. Just, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy, right? 
a cloud of ongoing debate swirls around racial and national identity, gender and sexual identity, political identity in government, and even denominational identity in the church. Can we be honest this morning? Because if we don't look at it and we don't say it's a problem, guess what? It's never going to go away. I have never seen the church more divided in my entire Christian walk as it is right now. Yeah. Ever. Some of these identifiers are inbred. Some of them are God-given. While some are matters of beliefs, values, and choice. But either way, church, listen to what I'm saying. People we love and care about in our families, our friendships, our, our circles, our work environments fall on both sides in almost every one of these issues. And I'm not talking about marginal, petty disagreements here. We are seeing lives devastated and families torn apart in these days. And nationally, we're watching substance abuse, suicide rates, crime, blah, 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 go on and on. It's just on the rise. And we keep trying to justify it, making excuses for it, whatever. But it's not working. It's not working. I believe wholeheartedly, I said it before, I say it again, the world's going to hell. It's a fact. The world as we know it, is done. Read the end of the book. But God says that the church, his people, he promises to make them stand out. To make them, if we, if we get what we're supposed to get, right? If we allow him to change our thinking. Why? So that we can draw people to the light, like, a, like the bug to the light, right? Right? So if we don't rise up, though, and embrace who we really are, then we'll always, always, always fall short. I was hearing beeps. Did you hear beeps? Identity is a core issue, church. What you and I believe about God and ourselves are two of the most foundational beliefs that need to be in our hearts. And the further these eternal beliefs sway from the truth, the more havoc our distortion, interpret, our distorted interpretation of our identity wrecks havoc on our behavior. Why? Because as a man thinks, so he is. A person who doesn't understand his or her identity will never understand and find their position in life. Ever. They will run around randomly functioning in a fog. They'll frustrate themselves. They'll frustrate everybody around them. They might rant things like, quit judging me. I'm trying my best. That line just drives me crazy. <laughs> but the behavior is not the core problem. See, that's the thing. They don't understand who they really are. And so until we understand who we really are, We'll never be who we're really supposed to be. We'll always be something else. Always. Guys, if a cow begins to think it's a chicken, he will unnecessarily live a life of frustration. You believe that? He'll be depressed. He'll be disillusioned, especially when he tries to lay an egg or jump on a fence and crow like a rooster. People who begin embracing a lie about their identity will constantly struggle. Constantly struggle. They'll be confused. There'll be inconsistencies between their thoughts and their emotions and the reality of God's word in everyday life. Jesus warned us that we could easily frame our lives around false assumptions and self-deception. And we need to be careful on, and on guard about the people whose teachings we follow and who are influencing our lives. Let me read you a couple of scriptures here. Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> 15 to 23. Yep. All them. All red letters. 
Jesus talking, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. Good fruit. Every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruit. Hallelujah. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, this is somebody should be listening right now. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These are people who are deceived. They actually believe that they're going to heaven. They actually believe that they're following God. But it's based on what? It's based on what? Paul also says something pretty wild in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. You can write these down and we'll read them later if you want to. Ephesians chapter 4, 14 and 15. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. I'm going to talk about that. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. See, regardless of where we've come from, what kind of identity issues that we're dealing with, guys, we need to take these words to heart. Let's not be like gullible children. Easily duped by whatever is making the loudest, most impassioned noise at any given moment. I, I can't. I have dozens and dozens of stuff sent to me daily. Different videos, different things, different that, different this. And I'll tell you right now, I don't take none of them at face value. None. None. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, I don't even look at it. If I can't find it in the word of God, it's, it's nothing to me. Nothing. I don't care what people think. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people feel. I don't care about none of that. You know what I mean. Of course I do. But I care about the truth. I care about what God says. Because we, we have to start there. If we don't start there, then it's, it's wrong. It's wrong. And let's not artificially separate walking in love with walking in the truth. This drives me crazy. Both are valuable and necessary, but neither or never can they be separated at the expense of truth. We have churches embracing things that are the antithesis of what the Word of God says. And they said they're doing it in love. No, you ain't. You don't love them, people. You don't love them because you're giving them misinformation. You're, you're, you're deceiving them. And you're leading them down a path that is contradictory to the word of God. So don't say you love them. I'll say it again. You can wrap as much bacon as you want around a turd. It's still a turd. And so you can say, oh, it's love. They love each other. No, you don't. You have feelings. You have emotion. Yes. Yes. But it's not love. Why? Because God determines what love is. God is love. God created love. If it doesn't line up with his word, it's not love. It's not love. It's feelings. It's emotions. That's all it is. 
See, otherwise, we and the people we love will find ourselves building our lives on shifting sand. And the results will be tragic. People whose lives are built on feelings, desires, and emotions, and other people's opinions other than the Word of God. Now, that is the truth. And I know it's not popular in some circles. I know that. Love in a marriage is between a man and a woman. Period. Why? Because God says so. You could dress it up all you want. You could put all the emotion and all the feelings and all the whatever you want. It's wrong. It's wrong. And if you're in a, pl- a place to influence people and you're saying that's right because you're the only ones who love, <laughs> you are deceiving people and you're not loving them. You're actually hurting them. Good. Feelings are powerful communicators, but not reliable resor- resources of truth. Feelings are powerful communicators, but not reliable sources of truth. Our feelings are one of the most shallow and unstable parts of our lives. Emotions can swing all over the map, bypassing logic, ignoring reality, and reacting to speculations. Just because something feels true does not make it true. Feelings are basically fickle followers, not dependable leaders. They should be seen as the caboose following the train, not the locomotive that pulls it. The day we quit letting our feelings run our lives and start walking in the truth, that's a great day of liberation, let me tell you. And it might not seem that way in the situation you're in now. But God's word is true. God's word is true. It might mean you have to give up everything that you feel Everything your emotions are attached to. But the truth is the truth. And the truth will set us free every single solitary time. Period. Period. If it's not truth, what is it? No matter how it feels, right, bro? No matter how it feels. While feelings can actually help us discover what we already believe in our hearts, they're not often a good gauge at what is true and what we should believe. So where do our feelings come from? That's what we have to look at. Where do our feelings come from? Well, they come from all kinds of different sources. But the Bible gives us a clue about how, how, church, we can sort out our feelings and trace them back to the point of origin. Each of us is comprised of a body, a soul, and a spirit. In fact, the Bible always says spirit, soul, body, because that's the right way. When we're, when we're operating spirit, soul, body, we'll be in a good place. But we'll, we'll, for, for sense, sake of argument this morning, we'll go body, soul, spirit, all right? So we're, 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 we're comprised of a body, a soul, and a spirit, interconnected with one another, and all three can affect and influence how we feel. First one is our body. Now, according to the Word of God, our body is a temple. It's supposed to be a mobile tabernacle. (laughs) But it needs to stay well-fueled and well-tuned, to say the least, right? Because if not kept under control, it will lead us off a cliff. Our flesh will lead us right off the cliff. Some days our bodies feel great. Other days, our body's not so great. 
especially when you're getting my age. Sometimes it might feel despondent or demanding, make us think we should overeat, oversleep, even sleep around. So it should be led and stewarded well, but not trusted and followed. Our bodies don't care what's right or wrong. And it will betray us quickly if we let it. If we give it the wheel, oh, it'll drive. <laughs> it'll drive. That's why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read it out of the New English, the New English Standard Version just because I liked it best in the English Standard Version. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. So that's very easy to point at the pastors, and, we, and you should, and you should. But we're all preaching to somebody, ain't we? <laughs> we're all influencing somebody. We're all talking to somebody. We're all declaring how much we love Jesus to somebody, and they're watching. And they're watching. Church, we need to understand, most of the time when the world is watching us, they're watching us to find flaw. They're watching us so that they can find us doing something wrong so that they can justify not giving up what they know they're supposed to give up and, and join us. Number two is our soul. Our soul is commonly believed to, comp to be comprised of our mind, our will, and our emotions. It can also very, very much impact our feelings. Jesus said the night before his crucifixion, he said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. His feelings were being influenced by his knowledge of what was to come. The thoughts in our heads and our core beliefs in our hearts will directly affect our feelings and our emotions. We may be spiritually and physically healthy, but if we mentally allow our thoughts to dwell on things not of God, eventually we will start to believe that lie, right? Especially if we dwell on it. We will feel the darkness and the bondage of it. Lot in the Old Testament felt his righteous soul tormented by all the sin that he saw around him. Number three is our spirit. Now, our, our spirit also affects our feelings. Absolutely. Love, joy, and peace. They're three big ones. How many of you guys like to feel them? We like to feel loved. We like to feel joy. We like to feel peace. Don't we? These are spirit, spiritual fruits, and they can be tangibly felt in our hearts when we walk with God. When we walk with God. In contrast, David felt an agonizing loss of joy when he lives in spiritual sin in Psalm 51. God will often guide us with feelings of peace and conviction in our spirits, tells us in Colossians 3.15, which will be useful in directing our steps in obedience. But the filter of his word must still remain the plumb line of truth. This is where a lot of people in the church fail and fail miserably. I don't know how many of you in this room read your Bible every day. I don't know. I know there's a lot of us that read this little devotion thing that somebody else wrote. Because you send them to me for every day. I get them every day. You know what I mean? But how many of you pick up the Bible? Pick up the Bible. Meditate on the word. Take time for God to listen. 
write in it, talk, spend time. Spend time. The filter has to be the Word of God. Where feelings and His Word do not align, we have to trust His Word, which doesn't change. And we have to understand that just because I feel a certain way, it's not lining up with the Word of God. So my feelings must be wrong. Even if they feel real good. See, our feelings are always subject to change, right? But the Word of God is never subject to change. It's always the truth. And it's still the most relevant book, most contemporary book that we can read. Let me read you something in 1 John chapter 3. We're getting somewhere, so don't worry. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. (laughs) So you could take guilty out, and you could put any word you want in there, right? Even if we're feeling marvelous, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Even if we're feeling whatever, whatever we're feeling. So lock into this, church. Many people foolishly let their feelings, regardless of the source, determine what they believe to be true about who they are and what is morally right for them. Whatever I'm doing and I think is good, If it don't line up with the word of God, it's immoral. I don't care how it feels. Sorry, church. It doesn't matter how it feels. Sin feels good. You know how I know? (laughs) Because, boy, did I commit a whole lot of them in my life. People think if I don't feel loved, then I must not be loved. If something feels good, it must be good. If something feels right, it must be right. How about this one? If I'm attracted to someone, then it must mean God made me feel that way. (laughs) Holy cow. Don't laugh because there's a a few of you in here that jumped on that boat. I mean, it could go on and on. If it feels like God hates me and is against me, then he must be. If I feel I'm worthless and should hurt myself, then maybe I should. This line of thinking is backwards, it's unreliable, and... Sometimes it's tragic. A lie will feel true if you really want to believe it, church. A lie will feel true if you really want to believe it. A hypochondriac who really believes he's sick can physically make himself feel sick. Doesn't mean he's sick. Worry can stir up fearful feelings as if, as if something has already happened when nothing has happened at all. How many people, you got friends, you got friends that go from zero to I'm dead. Nothing even happened yet. <laughs> you slept on your arm wrong. It hurts all. Oh. Oh, I got to go to the hospital. 911. (laughs) 
Worry can stir up fearful feelings as if something has already happened when nothing really has happened at all. Painful experiences are powerful teachers. Emotional experiences are deeply memorable. And if those messages are a lie about our value and about our identity, and if it's reinforced by said emotions, it's hard for us not to believe it and be deceived by it. Whether it was verbal, physical, or sexual abuse, if someone rejects or hurts or crushes you, or you start to believe the lie that you're worthless and unloved, you will start to feel that way even though it is not true. true. Our feelings will follow our heart's beliefs. Our feelings will water the seed of a lie that we're considering, and it will help to take root in our hearts. Then the lie, because now it's planted, right? Now it's getting watered. It will reinforce itself with more feelings. Think about it. Angry thoughts lead to angry feelings, which lead to more angry thoughts, which means to more angry feelings, which leads to more angry thoughts, which means leads to more angry feelings. And on and on we go. Depressing thoughts are handcuffed to depressing feelings, which bring about more depressing thoughts, which cuff us to more depressing feelings. And on and on we go. And on and on we go. If you're a man who begins to genuinely question, consider, and ultimately start to believe that you're a woman, your thoughts and feelings will reinforce those assumptions. And next thing you know, you go from a triathlon gold medal winner, handsome man's man, to whatever the heck his name is now. What's her name? His name. Caitlin. Next thing you know, you're Caitlin. It's sad. It's sad. We should not believe everything we feel, church. <laughs> and we definitely shouldn't believe everything we think. Even if we felt a certain way for a long time, church, God's word reminds us that feel, believing a lie for as long time doesn't make it truth. It will never make it truth. I don't care how long we believed it. It's not true. It's not true if, it, if it, I can't find it in the Word of God. Amen. Let me read something to you. Jeremiah chapter 17. I bet you somebody knows this, this scripture in here. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. I'm going to read out a new American Standard Version. Cause, again, because I like it. No other reason. The heart is more deceitful than all else. <laughs> and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Don't look. What's the next verse? I, the Lord, he says. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. In other words, God says, you can't understand your own heart. You don't know what the heck you're thinking. Why can I say that? I, I created you. <laughs> I know what's going on in your heart. I know what you're thinking right now. And it's a lie. Let me fix it. Let me fix it. Even Solomon, the smartest guy who ever lived, supposedly, I, I, I kind of question that, though, man. That dude, that dude did some silly stuff, man. For being the smartest guy that ever lived. Look, I have a hard time with one wife. That cat 
had 700 wives and 300 girls on the side. He was a glutton for punishment. I'm sorry, man. That dude just, he just, I, and he's supposed to be the smartest guy in the world. Only the men are left. <laughs> Let me read you something else. A lot of scripture today. Proverbs chapter 28. I'm not afraid of them women, man. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Man, did you hear that? He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Where does wisdom come from? Come on, you know, say it. I know it's hot. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from God. How do I work? How do I walk wisely? I walk wisely when I'm listening to God. When I'm listening to my heart, I'm a fool. When I listen to the Lord, I'm wise. I'm wise. So wise discernment of our feelings is vital to maintaining healthy thinking, and it's an accurate viewpoint of our identity. Regardless of the source, we must filter it through the wisdom and we must filter it through the truth of God's word. I don't know how everybody's feeling about themselves in this room, but I can tell you God knows you and God feels a way about you that you need to understand. Yeah. Regardless. The Bible tells us this in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Paul smacking us in the face all the time. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Let me read it in the English Standard Version because this one's a little bit deep. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says... We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So when my thoughts, I don't know about the rest of you, but I got some whacked up stuff going in this noodle right here, man. There are some things that can pop into my head that if I dwell on them, oh boy, oh boy. I'll, I'll be gone. Gone. Even after all this time serving God, even after all 21 years I've been pastoring and I'm still not right. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. It forces me to depend on God. I think the secret is to come to know that. <laughs> that's the trick. I'm jacked up. You should say that. I'm jacked up. I'm all jacked up, Lord. Help me. Help me. So I need to take those thoughts captive so that they obey Christ. So if I'm thinking of doing something that I know Christ wouldn't do, guess what? I, I, Lord, take this thought from me. Take this thought from me. This is not the man you want me to be. This is not what I'm supposed to do. This is not who I am. Right. Our desires do not determine our identity or our destiny. Again, Scripture warns us to follow God-honoring desires and turn away from sinful desires. One more Scripture, maybe. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. You familiar with that? 16 to 23. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. 
I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. No law. That means I can have at it. (laughs) Regardless of how we feel, Scripture says God is never the reason we sin. Our own sinful desires, not God's, not God's, are what causes us to do the wrong thing. God is actually the source of every good thing, right? He always has our best interests at heart, and he wants us to enjoy his best desires. He wants us to freely, freely walk in the truth without the heartbreak or the hangover afterwards. So the biblical response to wrong desires is to willingly turn from the stumbling blocks of our lives and apply the word of God to our lives. That's how we do it. Uh, One more. James chapter 1. The Bible has a lot to say about this, guys. I didn't write this book. James chapter 1, 13 to 21. Let Let me read this to you. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted, listen, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I want to do that, whatever that is. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Guys, God can renew our minds if we let him. God can renew our hearts if we let him. God can change what feels good to us if we let him. God can change our priorities if we let him. He saves, he can save our souls. He can restore us. He just said it. He can fill us with his love. He can give us the mind of Christ. His best for us is within reach if we'd be willing to put our trust in him. Stop allowing our feelings. Stop allowing our emotions. Stop that. We should all just know that they're fickle, period, and trust God. Church, the words and opinions of people are varied, they're contradictory, and they can easily change or swing to any extreme. One person sees you as smart, another one says you're an idiot. One person calls you a winner. Another post on social media that you're the world's biggest loser. When it comes to our identity, even if we line up 10 people who say they know us well, they still only know a small fraction of our words, our thoughts, and our actions, don't they? They don't know us well. Who has total perfect understanding? and could articulate everything about us flawlessly. There's only one person. There's only one guy that really knows us. Jesus didn't didn't base or alter his own sense of identity on what other people thought or said about him. If he did, he never would have made it to the cross. 
He never would have completed his mission. I, I, last week I showed you, first day. First day in ministry. Anybody remember last week? Was anybody awake? First day they tried to kill him. First day. They tried to throw him over a cliff. <laughs> he didn't let that influence who he was. Why? Because also the first day of ministry, his father told him who he was. This is my son, who I am well pleased, and he didn't do anything yet. Who I am well pleased. And God says that to each and every one of you in this building here this morning. This is my son. This is my daughter, who I am well pleased who I have given my life for, who I have died for, who I have got all the goodness of heaven waiting for them if they just put themselves in a place to receive it. Some people listened and followed him, others questioned and angrily opposed him. Everything he did, some people. Even when people were believing him, he still didn't let the effects... He still didn't let that affect him. Because he says this in John. John chapter 2. Man, I looked at a lot of scripture today. John chapter 2, he said this in 24 and 25. See, Jesus knew, man. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. We've all had people butter us up. <laughs> We've all had that stuff. We like it. Fickle. See, Jesus understood that it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Throughout our lives, we will each hear a wide variety of helpful and hurtful things that will be said about us. Some loving, some hateful, some completely true, some totally wrong. Words can be very powerful, church. Sometimes what people say about us can cut deep, it can get into our hearts, it can start to feel true. Then when we reply, when we replay those words over and over in our head, what happens? We can reject them, which would be a good thing. We can either play them over and over and then start wondering if they're really true, and then we can even believe them if we allow ourselves. But if anything happens that reinforces them, then what? We overreact out of fear, and we struggle to prove that them things were said were wrong. Whether it's fear of looking stupid, fear of failure, fear of being overlooked or replaced, or the fear of being rejected, unloved, or abandoned, all of those can torment our thinking if we are not grounded in the solid truth of what God says about us. I cannot stress it enough, church. We have to remind ourselves every day with God's word. We have to allow the Lord. We need God to speak to us. We need God to say things to us. We need to, we need to hear things like Proverbs 29. Let me read this to you. Proverbs 29. This is wonderful. Verse 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Is safe. We need to hear that. We need to remind ourselves what, what, what Paul wrote to Timothy. You've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. We need, to be, we need to tell ourselves this every day. We need to allow the Lord to speak to us, speak to us, speak to us. Because I'll tell you what, guys, there's a thousand other voices speaking to you at the same time. A thousand. Sometimes they yell. So to wrap this up, we have to be careful about grounding our identity in fluctuating things that will set us up for failure and disappointment. 
We need to be defined by God, not our own changing feelings, not our fickle desires, not Facebook likes or comments, or any other assessment of us. If I can go to bed at night and say, Lord, how did I do today? And he says, Frank, well done. <laughs> it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It really don't. We all have issues. Let's get over that. Let's stop playing church. Start being the church. Everybody in this room has issues. Every one of us. And we should continue to walk in humility and love. But we need to be willing to learn and grow. We need to stop making the excuse, don't judge me, I'm doing my best, when you know you're not. <laughs> but as we look at this in the coming weeks, guys, this is my hope. I hope that we discover who we really are as told by the one who really knows who we are. Not what everything else says, not what our feelings say, not what was said about us in the past, not what spoke over us, not what happened to us, none of that, none of that, but what God says, what God says. And then I hope we can live our lives based on what God says, not on our feelings, not on our emotions, but on the truth. And then be people willing enough to love people enough to tell them the truth. Not what they want to hear. Not because it's politically correct. Not because it's socially accepted. But because it's the truth. It's the truth. Guys, because when we do, we will come to have a life-changing breakthrough that will unlock our best in us. I believe the best is yet to come. Amen. I know it looks crazy. I'm excited. I'm excited. They're losing their stinking minds out there. Good. Come on in. We got somebody to help you out. We got somebody to help you out. Can I pray for us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us the wisdom and discernment to filter all those messages that are coming at us constantly, Lord, constantly. Help us to build our lives and our thinking on truth. Change our hearts, O oh God, and cleanse us of any sinful and harmful ways that is in us. Renew our minds and our habits by your grace, Lord. Help us to speak the truth in love and not be swayed by our feelings not be swayed by our desires that are leading us away from you, Lord, that are leaving us away from loving you and are leading us away from really loving people. Lord, help us to walk in your will. Help us to be the men and women that you've created us to be. Help us to be all that you say we are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you, lift up his countenance to you, and give you peace this day and forevermore. All God's awesome people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys, man. Have a great day.